Over on Purple Insider, a new Vikings history video is out about the time that Bud Grant, during a game against the Detroit Lions, only showed up to the game five minutes before kickoff. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch. And now, on with our feature presentation. A few years ago, I made a video about this man right here, Denver Broncos quarterback Craig Morton, and a game that he had against the Pittsburgh Steelers, where his Broncos won 21-7. If you want to learn more about that game, you can do so by clicking the card in the upper right corner. The performance itself wasn't anything remarkable. He had five sacks and only completed 41% of his passes. However, the noteworthy thing was that by the time it was time to conduct post-game interviews, he was no longer there. By the time backup quarterback Craig Penrose came into the game in mop-up duty, with the victory all but clinched, Morton was getting ready to leave the stadium because he had a wedding to attend. That's right, he was getting married the next day, and had to leave to catch a flight to get to the rehearsal dinner. It's an absolutely crazy story that has to be one of the most noteworthy of Norton's incredibly noteworthy career. However, I bring this up because a decade later, we would get another marriage story involving an NFL player that you're probably not aware of. And folks, the story here, with a few minor tweaks for dramatic effect, could easily be the plot to a movie. And I do not say that lightly. Seriously, someone should buy the rights to this, because this plot seems too good and heartwarming to be true, but it's made for the big screen as the next sports romantic masterpiece in the same vein as Jerry Maguire. Because this man right here is Atlanta Falcons defensive end Buddy Moore and during the 1987 season, something remarkable happened in his life that seems too good to be true. Because of all the crazy stories to come out during the 1987 season, this is the story behind what might just be the craziest one of them all. Before I talk about what exactly Moore did both on the field and off the field during this incident, we need some context to understand the landscape of the NFL as well as how Moore's career was going prior to this point. After playing his collegiate ball at Eastern Kentucky from 1977 to 80, Moore, like a lot of people, wanted to continue his professional football career at the NFL level. However, he was having some trouble catching on anywhere. He entered his name in the 1981 NFL Draft, and there was a debate about whether or not he could get drafted. The Orlando Sentinel ranked the interior defensive lineman, and Moore's name was on there, just outside the top 30. So while it was a long shot that he'd get drafted, he wasn't a complete outsider. In 12 rounds, there were 332 players that heard their name called, and got to make it on an NFL roster that day. Buddy Moore was not one of them. He signed as an undrafted free agent with the defending NFC champion Philadelphia Eagles. However, he was released in one of the first waves of cuts in mid-August. He then got another chance to try out for the Eagles in 1982, the first time he was waived and then reverted to IR. However, the second season wound up exactly the same as the first, as he was released before the start of the year. To be fair to Moore, another Philadelphia team had his eyes on him after he got cut as he signed for the Philadelphia Stars in the USFL. And to be fair to Moore, he was a pretty decent player on the defensive line for the Stars, playing all three seasons that the USFL existed for the Stars, and recording nine and a half sacks, including five sacks during the 1984 season. He was a good piece on the defensive line for a team that made the USFL championship all three years, and won the final two installments in 1984 and 1985. However, once that league went under, Moore couldn't have any success getting into the NFL and fulfilling that dream of his. As a last-ditch effort, he tried to make it with the Atlanta Falcons in 1987, but he was one of the first men cut. By this point, Moore was approaching 30, and despite years of trying, he had never made it onto an NFL roster for the regular season. Nor had he really come close. And Moore was a realist. He was done with football, 
and wanted to settle down. Moore was very soft-spoken and viewed football as a means to an end rather than life itself. Said Carl Park, a publicist for Eastern Kentucky, he was always low-key. He wasn't one to get all pumped up. And about Moore's love of the game, he said, I watch a game on TV occasionally. That's about it. With that, Moore settled down in Kentucky, going to Lexington, and set up a plumbing business. Said Moore on why he did that, I just thought it would be a good trade. I figure I'd never be replaced by a computer. It was clear. The football chapter of Moore's career was over, and it seemed like he was rather okay with that. And then came the strike. I've done plenty of videos on the 1987 strike before, so I'm not going to dive into too much detail here, as if you want to learn more about the strike, you can do so by clicking the card in the upper right corner. However, to make a long story short, after the second week of the season, the players went on strike, mainly because of the free agent policy in place. And the owners decided that, unlike 1982, where the season was paused until the strike ended, that the league would continue playing, and the show would go on, with replacement players playing until the strike was done. While some players crossed the picket line and played, many did not, meaning that these teams had to fill an entire roster worth of players with players who were not in the league and who were not playing professional football. Just like that, a bunch of people who thought that their football careers were over or that never dreamed of playing in the NFL were given a second chance and the opportunity of a lifetime. And sure enough, Buddy Moore, signing with the Atlanta Falcons, was one of them. And that was good for Moore, because the plumbing business wasn't going that well for him. He was sort of broke by this point and needed any cash influx to pay off his credit card debt. Said Moore, I had to pay off my visa bill. It was at the max. And the idea of making $2,000 to play football was good enough for him. However, playing in the NFL presented both good and bad news for Moore. The good news was that, in these replacement games, he actually was one of Atlanta's best players. Seriously, he was picking up, for the most part, right where he left off from his USFL heyday with the Stars, as he recorded a sack in each of the first two games. While the Falcons lost both of those games, losing to the Pittsburgh Steelers and the San Francisco 49ers, he recorded a sack against the Niners team that had quite a few players cross the picket line and forced an intentional grounding penalty for a safety in that game against the Steelers. Head coach Marion Campbell was so impressed by Moore, in fact, that he hinted at the possibility of keeping him around on the roster when the strike ended, making him one of the few replacement players to stick around. Said Campbell on this possibility, I don't want to name him, but I do have an idea on some kids. The bad news? On October 17th, Moore was planning on getting married back in Lexington to the love of his life, Jamie Curtis, who he met when he settled down in Lexington after his USFL career was done following the 1985 season. Obviously, this wedding was planned at a time when Moore thought his NFL career was completely done, and when he was focused solely on his fledging plumbing business. Moore took the NFL job for the money, but expected that he would be there for a week, maybe two weeks tops, and then he'd call it quits and be back in Lexington to live the rest of his life and get married. However, the strike went on and on, lasting roughly a month. Said Moore, I figured I'd be here a week at the most, but I kept on going. One day, I call my fiancé and tell her, they're about to settle. I'll be home soon. Then they wouldn't. All she'd say was, be here for the wedding. So now, we had a dilemma on our hands. We had a man who thought he was going to be in Kentucky, who was now in Atlanta collecting money and living out the last chance he would ever have to play professional football, and who was about to get married. And on October 17th, one day before the Falcons were set to take on the Los Angeles Rams in yet another replacement game, which was looking like it was going to be the final one 
before the regular players ended the strike and returned, Moore flew back to Lexington and had the ceremony outdoors at Jamie's parents' house overlooking the Kentucky River. The ceremony went well. However, the following day, Moore had to fly out of Lexington to Atlanta to make it on time for the game, meaning that he had to get to the airport super early, having no time to really settle down from the wedding. Cross his fingers that the plane was on time and that there wouldn't be any delays, and then rush over to Atlanta Foley County Stadium to make it to the game on time, since it was a 1 o'clock start. Talk about cutting it super close. And as if this crazy story couldn't get any more surreal, the Falcons enter this game as heavy underdogs. The Rams were favored by 12 and a half points and had players cross the picket line, like quarterback Steve Dills, who had played in the league for close to a decade by this point. At halftime, the Rams were leading 17-0 and looked to be in complete control of this game. However, the Falcons came storming back, stunning everyone by winning it 24-20. And one of the main reasons why they came back? As you can tell based on the highlights, it was the play of Buddy Moore, who had two sacks just hours after getting married and taking a flight to get there. Moore was walking away victorious both on the field as an individual and as a teammate, and off the field as a newlywed. With the strike ending after the game, and the regular players returning, Moore was now officially done with football, and spent the next week honeymooning, using the excess money he made from his great play in the NFL, where he had four sacks across the three replacement games, to fund that, before returning to his plumbing business back in Lexington. I mean, come on! You can just see the movie playing out in your head, can't you? If we tweak just a few details for the dramatic Hollywood effect, this could be a hit in the making. Have Moore almost lose his house and need one month to collect the money or else they're going to take everything, and then he gets this opportunity to play in the NFL. Have Moore debating whether to postpone the marriage or not, and his wife Jenny debating whether to call off the wedding and whether he cared more about football than her. Have that dramatic scene where Moore has a realization at practice that he might get to continue his pro football career after the strike is over. And then, at the ensuing practice, he leaves once he has the realization that he wants to make things work with his wife. Have the scene where he flies back and talks and has that heart to heart, and the wedding is back on. Then, after the wedding, have that scene where some citizen helps him make his flight on time, or makes it to the stadium on time, whether it's via police escort because there's so much traffic, or however you want to determine it. You can even keep the 17-0 part of the game exactly the same, and just have more record the game-winning strip sack or something to complete the comeback. This really feels too good to be true, but the basic premise for this story, about a player who never played in the NFL, finally getting his shot, and doing this as a way to pay the bills, then having to juggle this career that he never saw coming, with a marriage in a different place, and then ending his career not even 24 hours after getting married by having multiple sacks and a comeback victory, is completely 100% legit. Were the replacement games good football? Absolutely not. And I talked about just how bad they were in a previous video of mine. So if you want to learn more about that, and see some more examples, you can do so by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Was this a good time for the NFL? Absolutely not. However, the one month replacement experiment gave rise to some amazing stories from some amazing personalities that seem too good to be true, and that can't be replicated again. And this is a prime example of that. Because in 1987, in the strangest way possible, Buddy Moore got one more shot. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe, as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. 
see how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.